Thank you, Allison. Lynn, nice to meet you and, and everyone that's in the room. Good to see you today. I'm going to be sharing with you uh, really a topic that I think has never had a lot of airtime and really requires a lot of airtime. Uh, for anyone who knows me, they pretty much realize that um, I'm very candid. I will go there. I will talk about things that need to be spoken about that people are uncomfortable with. So you're going to be getting uh, a lot. <laughs> Uh, for starters, I started my first business uh, when I was 16 years old, and I'm going to be going through each business uh, chronologically, more on the emotional side, so it, and the whole goal is to inform you of where you can go about making businesses, taking a look at the emotional side, because it's a massive component, and it really doesn't get much attention at all. Most people just focus on the, the customer or uh, the money that you're going to make and market share, but not about you as a human being personally. So <clears throat> my first business, I actually was doing the math. I started 37 years ago. <laughs> I can't believe it's that long ago. I'm 53 now and I started it when I was 16. Never wanted to be an entrepreneur. That was never, ever the plan. Way too risk averse for that. Plus, I was a teenager. I didn't even really think about that. Well, one day during the summer when I was 16, my dad said, hey, uh, you're 16. Time for you to go get a job. And I said, okay, uh, no problem. I, I didn't mind that at all. And But again, I was young. I didn't really understand how the world works. So I just thought, I'm smart. I'm hardworking. I'm honest. Just apply for a job. You get the job. You make the money. Everything's fine. And that didn't happen at all. No one zero called me back for an interview and i had applied to like 10 places and i ended up uh, lowering my my threshold and i lowered myself to go apply for a job at mcdonald's and i was like oh, like <laughs> i'd be embarrassed to do that even they didn't call back and my self-esteem uh took a tank you know i thought god I, they don't even want me to run the fryer later like what, what kind of future do i have if i can't even get a job so i was i was despondent and my dad said, well, if you can't get a job, you're going to have to make your own. So you're going to start your own business. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he, my dad was in the bookbinding business. So basically anything made out of paper, uh, he did. So it was printing and bookbinding. So uh, he would make parking tickets. He made the Whitman sampler boxes. If you did a walkathon, the pledge sheet was something that he did as well. And he basically said, well, you're going you're gonna to sell copy your paper over the phone and you're going to borrow uh, a couple hundred dollars from me. Uh, actually, it was about $115, uh, which frightened me. I thought, I don't have a job. I just started a business against my will and I'm already in debt. So I, I was panicking. And the $100 was to have a phone installed at the house because my father said, you can't use the house phone. You have to have your own dedicated phone. You're in business. I found that unnecessary. And then he made me borrow $15 for a list of companies in the area from the Chamber of Commerce, which is basically my cold call list. So I started cold calling, which at the time cold calling didn't really exist. Uh, so that was a good thing. And when people would actually take your call. You call them and say, hi, I'm selling something and they would talk to you. And I was scared. I mean, the buckets of sweat sitting at the kitchen table in summertime in Ellicott City, Maryland, and it was, it was horrible. And I remember the first day I was just making lots of phone calls, nothing happened. And on the second day, I made my phone calls. Uh, my father made me keep a schedule. He told me to dress up, which I didn't do. And, and I remember I left to go play golf uh, after that afternoon. And when I came back, there was a message that my mom had taken someone had called me and they placed an order for $400 worth of copier paper. And my commission was $125. And I was over the moon. I'm like, oh my God, I, I created money out of thin air. But wow, I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, it could have been 10 cents and I would have been just as thrilled. It was just the fact that I created something out of nothing and I couldn't believe it. And I just felt like, wow, I could do anything. Just the power and the limitless possibilities and the excitement was, was really, really cool. So that was the start. And one of the deals, and this will be important for this, is uh, my father was able to get me free shipping. And that was a perk that I did for my clients that I just, I just passed on the free shipping. Again, I'm 16. I didn't realize that that was something that I could use powerfully. 
I ended up calling up uh, Baltimore Air Coil, and that was a company that made big air conditioners on top of like skyscrapers. I didn't even know what an air coil was. My dad's like, yeah, it's a big air conditioner. So I get this guy in the copy room, and he had been the, the copy room uh, person, and he had told me that this year was going to be his first time that he was able to do the purchasing. And so it was his first time doing this. And I said, well, could I, could I make a proposal? He said, sure. So my father had told me expressly, he said, don't ask people what they're paying because that's rude. But I didn't listen to that. So I said, what are you paying? And he told me, and I thought, cause I thought he doesn't know what he's doing either. So he told me, and then I said, okay, if I can come in a penny less, will I get the business? And he said, yes. Okay. So I go, okay, well, let me, let me just make sure I can deliver on that. So I, I called up the, the warehouse uh, at my father's company. He didn't own the company. He was like the senior vice president. He wasn't the owner, but he was kind of high up there. And I said, I just want to verify that shipping is free. And they said, yeah. I said, even on copier paper, because I'm looking to do a one-year contract with a really large company. And they said, yes. So I called the guy back the next day and I said, I can beat the price. And I said, so it's going to be, you know, a penny below what you're, what you're getting plus shipping, not free shipping plus shipping. Well, they ordered so much copier paper that the shipping was $45,000. So I actually made $45,000 in my first three weeks of business, which in today's dollars, that was about a quarter million. So I paid for four years of college at NYU with three weeks of work. Now, here comes the emotional part. My dad had always said, my money, my rules. Basically, I just was brought up that if you have the money, you make the rules. And I hated the business. I couldn't stand it. I, I, was, I hated cold calling. I hated copier paper. I could care less. The money was thrilling, but that thrill wore off so quickly. I was shocked because, I mean, I basically spent the money right away. I never saw it. It just went to tuition. And so I quit, and I went to our country club, and I went swimming in the pool. And I remember I was it was this 50 meter outdoor pool and I'm into the end of the lane and there's this hand in the water swishing back and forth, you know, to catch my attention. I pop my head up and there's my dad pissed off. And he's like, you're supposed to be at work. And I go, I just paid for college. He's like, I don't care. Go out and make more money. And I said, my money, my rules. I quit, went back in the water and swam the other way. And I shut it down. I hated it. And that was the first rule that I learned that even if you're making a ton of money, if you don't like what you're doing, you don't like what you're doing. There's nothing going to compensate you. And I really feel bad for people who have what I call golden handcuffs, where they're making a lot of money. They do not like what they're doing, but they got the mortgage and they've got the Audi or the BMW. They've got the kids in private school and they just don't want to go backwards financially. And I totally get that. I, I, I've, gone backwards financially once. It's awful. But um, you want to live a life of misery? Have at it. So I would say, really, I get, I get the idea if you've never made a lot of money before, you want to have a taste of that. I totally understand that. But the worst thing to do is to make a ton of money in something that you hate, because then you've created your own prison. And that was the first lesson that I learned that I will never, ever do a business that I don't love. So fast forward to going to NYU. Uh, that was about two years later. I go there. I'm 18. And I only wanted to go to NYU because Wall Street was there. I really didn't have any interest in going to college. I knew you had to, but I didn't really care. I applied to Harvard, got rejected. Uh, I really wanted to go to Wharton. I thought I was going to get in. Flat out rejected there too. So I was kind of devastated. And NYU was basically... Uh, where all the Ivy League rejects went, no one wanted to go to NYU. <laughs> like when you first met people at NYU, it's like, well, where did you really want to go? <laughs> it's never like anyone's first choice. It's a much better school now, but back then it was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. So um, I go to NYU, really didn't learn a thing. Sorry, I'm sure they say it's a better school now, but I really didn't learn anything. So I ended up uh, converting to the night school so that I could work uh, uh, daytime downtown. Well, in my, my finance, my introduction 
the finance class, which was from 6.30 to 9.30 at night, which was just, I learned nothing because I was kind of asleep during it. But Professor Wobbles was this guy that just knew a lot of people. And he said that a woman named um, Ruth Roosevelt uh, had married Bill Roosevelt, who was FDR's grandson. And she was the largest commodity trader, largest female commodity trader on Wall Street. She was looking for an assistant. And I thought, okay, I got to go work for her. So I wanted to beat all the other students. So I print out my resume on my little dot matrix computer at home. And I go downtown. She was working at a place called Thompson McKinnon at um, uh, One Financial Square, uh, right on the very southern tip of Manhattan. And I walk into the lobby and uh, you know, the security guard stops me. And you know, I, I am a bit precocious, I will say that. So I took out an envelope. You know, let me grab one here. So I had my envelope and my resume. And back then they had messengers, messengers on bikes that would have like a big backpack and they would deliver stuff. So I held up my resume and my envelope and I said, I have a, a message for Ruth Roosevelt. And they let me up. So I go up there, but then they had these doors that like lock. You had needed like, a, it's when they started with security, you needed the card key to, to get in. So I'm looking at the, the, uh, the floor plan and basically all the, the trading floor was on the perimeter of the building. And I thought, oh, everyone has a window. So the plumbing's probably in the middle of the window. So someone's gonna have to go to the bathroom eventually. So I just stood outside the door waiting for someone to go to the bathroom, which would open the door. So I open the door and I sneak in. And then again, I go up to Ruth. I, I, I asked this lady, she ended up being the, the stock analyst. I said, uh, you know, where's Ruth Roosevelt's desk? So she points over there and I see this woman. She, she looked really strange. Uh, she had this funny thing with her uh, mascara uh, and eyeshadow. And she looked kind of like a fortune teller, like doing a seance. And she had this weird bun on her head. Very strange looking, you know, eccentric looking. Um, but anyhow, I just held up my resume and I said, hi, Professor Wobbles sent me. And she's like, oh, well, what I didn't know is her second assistant had just quit that day, which meant she was out both assistants. So she was feeling desperate. So she didn't really know what to do with me. So she sat me down and said, um, you know, tell me what you can offer me and you know, why should I hire you? So I, I brought out this essay, which I found out later, she was just buying some time. And I, she hired me. I found out later she hired me because I looked like her son, Graham. So there's something to be said about people just sort of like liking the way you look. It wasn't really like my talent. She's just like, you look like my son. And I thought that was a good omen. So that was sort of random. Well, she ended up, um, she had married a guy named Julian Snyder, who had a, a newsletter called International Money Line. And he had a quarter million subscribers. And back in the late 80s, that's a lot of people. And it was a very expensive newsletter. Uh, he was uh, exiled to Switzerland because for some reason he had access to the Fed's beige book. That's, what, uh, that's where the interest rate movements were going to be. And he was publishing that. So the CIA went after him. Uh, he escaped the country and was publishing from Switzerland. And Ruth, who was, I don't know, like that was her third or fourth husband, um, she was running the, the money line desk at Thompson McKinnon, and that's what I was an assistant to. So there was like kind of weird stuff going on. But we had really famous clients. We had Dr. Strax, who uh, he invented the mammogram. Uh, a couple of desks over was David Johnston, who had traded money for President Ford and Carter. He made one guy so much money one year that um, he um, uh, bought him a Rolls Royce for Christmas. So that was pretty interesting. And Ruth ended up losing people money hand over fist. It was, it was pretty bad. So what I ended up doing is um, I cornered David at the urinal in the men's room, which if you want to talk to someone who's really important that doesn't want to give a kid the time of day, when you're at the urinal, you, you can't move. So he was sort of trapped and he had to talk to me for like a minute. And I said, David, look, I feel really bad. I hope I'm not interrupting, but you know, Ruth is losing people a lot of money. Could you like teach me how to trade so I can do better for the clients? So he started teaching me how to do trading and it was all technical analysis. So he was teaching me like chart analysis and I loved it. Well, I hated cold calling too. So I, instead I called up these really junky financial newsletters. Um, like the Chicago Board Options Exchange had these newsletters, things that you get in the mail that no one ever reads. And I said, could I contribute to uh, you know, your newsletters and to the magazines? And they all said yes. 
Well, what was interesting about this was when they all said yes to the whole thing, um, one of the challenges was they said, can you write me a letter? Could you write me something for, um, let's say, 500 words? which I thought was weird. I didn't understand that articles had to be like a certain size. So I was writing interest rate projections. I basically researched it and did it. But what I did with the, the newsletters that no one ever looked at was I photocopied them and I started junk mailing people. And I had the idea that if you're in print with a byline, you're an expert. And I started to get accounts that way. So I got rid of cold calling and the direct mail was free. Thompson McKinnon, they just paid for it. We, I just dropped it into the, um, uh, the mail room. Uh, I didn't know the fact that you're supposed to put in like your department code to get billed. I, I didn't know about that. So I was, I, I was doing like 50,000 pieces of mail a month, not realizing that someone should be paying for it. But <laughs> I didn't know. Uh, but anyhow, we ended up getting a guy named Gerald Appel uh, answered my, my ad. And he worked at a company called Signal Alert. <clears throat> well, I call him up and I'm thinking, oh, he's a burglar alarm salesman, Signal Alert. And I called him Jerry Apple. And he says, my name's Appel. And we're talking, talking, talking. And he opens up a $50,000 account, which is huge in commodities because you're highly leveraged. So a $10,000 account was a big deal. 50 was huge. And I um, get off the phone and I said to Ruth, I'm like, hey, I got a big account. This guy named you know, Gerald Appel. And she's like, he's like one of the most famous stock market traders in the world. How did you get him? And I didn't know who he was because I was on the currency trading side, commodities and futures. And so he ended up calling me again and said, you have to tell me what your trading system is because I'm registered with the SEC. And I thought, I thought he was making it up. And he said, if you want to see what I look like, I'm going to be on Lewis Rukeyser's Wall Street Week tonight. That was the only financial uh, TV show at the time. And so he ended up being, being real. Well, during this time, uh, we ended up merging with Prudential and we had our head analyst was named Jack Schwager. So Jack was, uh, he wrote a lot of books. He was a pretty famous technical analyst as well. And he had to talk to me too, because I was an employee. So Jack was giving me information and I called up Jerry and said, could we have lunch? And he was in Great Neck, New York, about a 40 minute train ride uh, out, of, out of Manhattan. And what I ended up doing is that I would shuttle information that Jack taught me as well as David Johnston taught me and I would give it to Jerry. And then Jerry was competitive and he gave me even better technical trading techniques that I brought back to Jack and David. And I actually got these three people to compete with their egos saying, well, my techniques are better. Try this, try this, try that. And I was publishing all of it because they had given it to me. So I started to get a name for myself. And then the first Iran-Iraq war broke out. Um, and this was uh, with Bush one. So we had bought a lot of Swiss francs. We shorted everything else. Because when you have uh, a political in a geopolitical uncertainty, uh, you end up buying a Swiss franc because they're neutral. Well, we won the war so fast that the Swiss franc tanked because we kind of won, won that war uh, pretty much in a few hours. So we came into the office the next morning. I showed up early around 7.30 in the morning and there were these two like mafia looking guys sitting on our desk. We had a client that owned an oil company in California. He had a $5 million margin call and they made us wake him up at 8.30 when the market opened to cover it. So that was a 5.30 wake up call for him in California and he paid it. But I started to see like the nasty side of when the markets fall apart, like when things fall apart, it gets ugly really fast. Then um, uh, Ruth obviously lost her people a lot of money. Uh, she got two complaints from two clients, and she never passed those complaints along to her manager, which is illegal. I didn't know about this. Uh, I called up Jerry Appel, and I said, listen, I think the markets are too volatile, and I'd like you to close your account until things settle down. And he said, okay. Uh, Ruth got in trouble for not reporting the complaints. So she got fired and that meant I was going to be fired. So I took the train out to Jerry's uh, place. We're having lunch and I said, I said, Jerry, look. Now, meanwhile, I was so tired. I was just going to go back to Maryland where I grew up and I was going to mow, mow my parents' lawn. I mean, I was kind of done. Um, or I was going to go work for Jerry Appel and ask him for a job. So it was, I was rolling the dice. And, um, I said, Jerry, look, you know, Ruth is going to be fired and I'd like to work for you. And 
he said, well, uh, I've had lots of people manage small accounts for me. And he goes, you're the only one who ever made me money. And you're the only one who ever told me to close my account trying to take care of me instead of yourself. So he goes, yeah, I'll hire you. I was like, okay. So uh, I am honest. I'm honest to a fault. <laughs> so it's like my friends. So uh, he gives me a job. And at the time I was making 45,000 and he offered me 28. And I'm like, wait a minute. Well, what's with the 28,000? He said, look, I'm not going to pay you for, you know, all the good work you did for other people. You're going to start at the bottom. And I didn't even do the math. I just came right back and I said, listen, if you're going to chop me that hard, you need to teach me how to trade the stock market. And he said, on your own time and with your own computer, not on company time, and I'll do it. And I said, fine. What I didn't realize with that is that that got me around the non-compete agreement I had to sign because everything I did was on my computer that I borrowed two grand on on my credit card and I, I operated out of my apartment. So I worked for him for about four years. I ended up getting up to like $50,000 a year, but I was trading 800 million bucks. Like half of that money was on trading systems that I had made as a researcher. So I was, I was resentful I wasn't making more money. And when I complained about it, he was like, you know, listen, you have the privilege of my client's assets. You know, why don't you stop being like so greedy? And he was very manipulative. I love the guy, but I mean, he, he was cheap. So I just got tired of not making um, more money. And uh, it was on either my fourth or fifth year. It was, it was, the end, it was my fourth year review. Um, we went out to lunch and I basically said, because he was a psychologist, so he knew how to manipulate people and I learned how he did it. So I manipulated him back and I said, Jerry, you know, um, I blew over $80,000 at college and you're simply not returning on my investment. So I went to college. I'm not making enough with you. And, and he just kind of looked at me and I said, if I were your son, what would you advise me to do? Which I knew I was going to get him with that one. And he said, okay, start your own shop. Just don't steal my clients. And I said, fine. So I started my own company, uh, it was MMR, McCarthy Market Research. And I started with my IRA, $2,000. And I entered a trading contest in Barron's. And you just have to give them your account statements of your buying sell orders and they just see how the account moves. And I ended up, I knew that I was going to be number one. Uh, I felt confident with that because the smaller amount of money you have, and Jerry Appel invented market timing. Uh, so I felt confident that I was going to win it. And I remember calling them up to say, you know, hey, did I win? And they said, oh, well, you know, we didn't get your, they got my account statements, but somehow they, they lost my stuff. And they're like, you can enter the next contest. And I said, no, I want it. And I know I want it. And I will sue you if you don't put me in. So they ended up agreeing and they reprinted the Barron's article. And in 1994, I became the number one stock market timer in the world because of that. So I'm glad I, I had a fight for it. And then the phone rang off the hook uh, in about, I don't know, uh, first year, uh, I took in a million dollars. Uh, I had MMR from 94 to 04. And about three years into it, I had about $100 million under management. And then I made another $150 million with that 100. So by the time I was 36, I was managing about a quarter billion dollars. And partway into that, I guess around year seven, uh, I had moved to Boston from New York and my assistant gave me my money management report and I looked at it and I was making a half a million bucks a month and I was like, holy shit. And you know, you can't really tell anybody that kind of number. So I ended up, um, I ended up wanting to call my mother and I, I wanted to chat with her and say, you know, kind of brag, like you can brag to your mom. And my dad answered the phone and I didn't really have a great relationship with my dad, but my mom wasn't around. And this was when cell phones were kind of new. So this is what, I don't know, around 91 where the reception was kind of sketchy. And I said, dad, you know, you won't believe it. Uh, I'm making a half a million a month. And he goes, uh, he goes, great. Send some down here. And I, I'm like, what? And he, he kind of yelled at me and he goes, don't be greedy. And I'm like, what? I'm thinking it's like the cell phone's not working right. And he goes, uh, he goes, yeah, you're, you're making enough money. Send some down here, spread the wealth. And I'm like, wow, uh, you feel entitled to my money. Where's the congratulations, son? I'm proud of you. 
And that was when I started to realize that uh, when you're making a lot of money, you are very different from other people. You're, you're in another category. And I started to learn there was a lot of resentment. Uh, there's a lot of people that felt that uh, if there's a, a belief from my experience that if you make a lot of money, people feel like you rip someone off to get it, that you're taking advantage of people. And that really pissed me off because, you know, I earned everything I made. I never got money from anyone. And I, I, it was a cheap business to start, $125 to be registered with the SEC. So it wasn't like you needed, you know, a million dollar seed investment to get the thing going. And, you know, 125 bucks, a laptop and a cell phone, and, you know, you're a registered investment advisor. So I was angry at that. Also, for every dollar I made, my clients made $15. My average account made 25% a year with the risk of a bond. So I was like, you know, don't give me this stuff that I'm ripping people off. People are getting a really good deal with me. So I started to be sort of, you know, aggressive about people um, taking that attitude. But then I started to realize um, I should have kept my mouth shut. Um, it's really not a good idea to let people know um, how much you have. Uh, for example, uh, my dog has been, was kidnapped and held for ransom. Uh, when I had a divorce, I had four bodyguards. Um, I collectively of all my houses, I've been burglarized uh, 19 times. So there's there's a downside to it. And so now I'm I'm much more low key about you know what goes on. So by the time I was 36, there was a scandal on Wall Street, and unfortunately. <laughs> It's kind of the start of it. We had $100 million at Alger, and we, I had figured out a way for market timing not to disrupt mutual funds. Because basically, a market timer trades in and out of mutual funds, which is like trading baskets of stocks without paying the commission. So we could have never traded stocks and made the money we did because the bid ask spread and the commission would have killed us by about 20%. So mutual funds was like trading baskets commission free. That's how we made all the money. And when we became popular, at least 200 competitors came into the space. And so mutual funds started to kick people out and we were on blacklist. So a lot of our money was being kicked out from mutual funds that were doing really well because they wanted buy and hold uh, people who were low expenses. They didn't want people like me trading every 36 hours. Well, I figured out a way to do market timing without impacting the fund. But the funds had no interest in listening to me, except the, the vice chairman of Alger was a guy named Jim Conley. I told him how I was doing it. And he said, okay, if you give us a hundred million bucks, uh, we'll let you, we'll give you a direct line to the portfolio managers. You tell us what your signal is, your buy sell signal, and you know, off we go. So we did it and it worked uh, until their fund stopped being correlated to our buy and sell indicators. So we would basically trade off the NASDAQ composite you know, if it's up, we buy. If it's down, we sell. Basically, it was a momentum model. And um, uh, they just started to delink. I mean, the days that the NASDAQ was up, they'd be down and then the opposite. So we, we, were, we were losing money there and I had to leave. So he was pissed. And we pulled that $100 million out and went over to Schwab with it. Well, they replaced my mutual fund space with uh, Sugarland Hedge Fund in Texas, who were the Hart's uh, Flea Collar Brothers. Uh, from what I understand, they weren't too ethical. When they had the flea collar business, they would go into pet stores and take other people's pet collars off the shelf, flea collars off the shelf and put theirs on, like so that, people, so that eye level, their stuff would be there. So that was kind of sinister. But they ended up um, trading, they, Jim let them trade after the market closed based on news. So let's say earnings or something came out, he would let them reverse their buy and sell orders. So he got caught. Jim went to jail for three years. Uh, the attorney general of New York, uh, with Cuomo, was running for governor. Uh, no, it wasn't. It was Spitzer. It was Elliot Spitzer. Um, he was running for governor. And so he took it upon himself to clean up Wall Street. And my friend Rashmi Vasish was his um, public relations director or press secretary. And she called me. She was my neighbor. Um, that's how I knew her. She called me and she's like, you know, uh, everyone's on a hit list and, and you're on it. Uh, all market timers are on the hit list. She's like, you're not going to be called in for questioning, but a lot of other people are. And she's like, you should stop doing interviews and kind of lay low. And so people started to go to jail. And that was when I retired because mutual funds were like, no more timing. You know, Jim went to jail. Um, you know, I was making six million a year. So I was like, screw this. I'm just going to take off. So I, I shut the business down at 36. 
Um, I bought a 50 acre lake uh, in Groton, Massachusetts on Lake Massapog. And, you know, I thought, oh, cool, American dream, retire early, isn't this wonderful? And I remember the first morning uh, I woke up and I'm walking down my peninsula to the beach and I just got really sad. And I'm like, I don't matter anymore. Like, nobody needs me. I mean, I had 1,200 clients, so my phone was always blowing up, and the phone stopped ringing. Um, a lot of people didn't know uh, why I retired. I, I gave the business to my partner, uh, so I'm finding out through the grapevine that people thought, uh, like, that I had AIDS, I had cancer. You know, it, it was it ended up being really, really bad, and. Uh, I ended up getting uh, an anxiety and depression problem that I didn't understand. Uh, I, when I first started getting panic attacks, I thought it was uh, heart problems because my family has heart disease. So I remember the ambulance picking me up in the middle of the night, going to the hospital, and um, they're like, oh, you had a kidney stone. So we took care of that. Uh, it took a while to figure out I was having panic attacks. I uh, didn't understand why I was depressed, had, had no reason to be depressed. So I went to the shrink and I went through 24 different psychotropic drugs, which were awful. Lost my sex drive, gained about 50 pounds. Couldn't drive anymore because I was taking this one antidepressant called Effexor that put this like electric zap through my right eye. So I'd be on the mass pike driving. And when I would be like in the middle of changing lanes, I'd like black out for a second. And when I would kind of come to again, I didn't know if I was going from left to right or right to left and all the, the cars are honking. And, um, so I was like, okay, this is gonna get me killed. So I had to get a driver, which again, on the outside looked good. Mikey has a chauffeur, but it's like, no, I felt like driving Miss Daisy in the back seat. And um, I was miserable, but no one, I couldn't tell anybody. They're all like, well, poor you with your chauffeur in your lake. Um, so it was a bad time, the, the pills didn't work. I ended up um, studying mind-body medicine out of desperation. So Reiki, yoga, shiatsu, I, Trade it all, tried it all. What really worked for me is um, I went to the extension school and I took the positive psychology class taught by Tal Ben Shahar. And it was 1200 students in the class. You know, the extension school wasn't allowed to go to the day class. We were allowed to, to watch the video, you know, piping in. Well, I can be persuasive. So I, I basically said, hey, you know, can I like pay extra and come to the class? And they said, yes. So I sat in the front row, it was a rock concert, and I, I couldn't believe that you could learn how to be happy. And that like totally turned me around. Like, I mean, literally it was like a switch. And what I had learned was my mother had always been right. She said, Michael, you need to get another job. And I'm like, mom, no one's ever gonna pay me what I used to make, forget it, I'm not gonna do that. I'm used to being the boss, I can't work for anybody. And um, well, she was right, because what I learned is that if you don't have a purpose or a meaning in life, uh, life doesn't really mean too much. And I didn't retire from my job. I had retired from life. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to go back to work. I wasn't sure what to do, though. Um, I was also taking an emotion class at the uh, extension school. And we learned about orthomolecular medicine, which was food for medicinal function. And we had learned this really interesting story about uh, there was a, a doctor in a psych unit that had schizophrenics in lockdown by, because of the violence. When you put them on gluten-free diets, the violence went away. And I thought, if you can control violence and anger with gluten and diet, could you influence anxiety, depression, and mood with diet? And that was, that was my quest. And I started to look into it. And the answer is yes. Actually, you can have much more impact. So I ended up getting uh, a book off of Amazon that still exists called The Mood Cure. And it's basically foods that you can use for medicinal function for, for anxiety, mood disorder. And they have all these diagnostic tests that are very strange, like do you have white flecks in your fingernails, which are all about nutrition deficiencies. And what I discovered was, you know, I was drinking way too much alcohol, uh, cigarettes, weed, all that, you know, eating out for dinner every night. So, you know, the diet was crap. Um, so I was doing a lot of bad things, uh, you know, caffeine, sugar, salt. And then it was telling me about foods that would help with anxiety, like magnesium is green. Uh, so the darker the green leafy vegetable, the more magnesium, like kale, uh, iceberg lettuce is effectively useless. Um, so I ended up changing my diet uh, 100%. Uh, and within 48 hours, I had my last panic attack. And that was well over 10 years ago. So I got excited. And I ended up going to nutrition school in New York. 
uh, which was great. I mean, just everyone was like rah, rah, rah on the whole, you know, vegan, gluten-free, you know, healthy diet, really enthusiastic. And they were teaching you to be like a health coach. And I thought, you know, there's no scale in that. The most I could do is maybe talk to five people a day. And I thought, how could I get the scale? And I thought, what if I made a food product that helped people with anxiety and depression? And what if I made it taste so good that they just bought it because it tasted good? So that was the basic idea. And what I ended up doing is that I moved to Germany. I went to baking school to learn how to make commercial food products. And so I'm living in Germany for, I don't know, about two months. I was in Weinheim. And I speak German. So the, the bakers really liked me. And I basically said, look, I don't know shit about baking. Um, but... I was reading a book called Sugar, Salt, Fat, uh, which is about how you design food products. It reads like a murder mystery. It's a really, really good book. And I thought, okay, instead of me doing taste tests and all that and trying my own, why don't I just retrofit something I know that people like? So I retrofitted the chocolate chip cookie and the blondie brownie with hemp seeds and chia seeds. And all the bakers in Germany helped me retrofit it. And so I, I had the product, I had the recipes, I came back to the United States and that was when I made my company Booty Bar, B-U-D-I-B-A-R. It was originally Buddha Bar, uh, but that name was actually in a lawsuit between Buddha Bar in New York, which is like a lounge, uh, lounge music nightclub, and then Buddha Bar in France, which I think had made uh, like lounge music. So they were fighting over the name Buddha Bar. And I had asked some people, what do you think of the name? And they all kind of came back with, it sounds like a fat guy and it sounds like a religion. So that never occurred to me. So I thought, well, what would be like a skinny Buddha? And I thought booty would be, would be it. And I reverse Googled, looked up, what does booty mean in a foreign language? And it actually means wise in Sanskrit. So I thought, oh, it's all food for brain function. So booty bar was born and I didn't realize that when you say it, it sounds like a strip joint. You know, there's all this stuff I just didn't know. You know, people call up like, you know, booty bar. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, we're not taking dance for applications. Sorry. But it ended up being, I swear to God, I made so little money at that company, but it was the best thing for me, for my soul. I, I got into Whole Foods. And, you know, again, I had to do some persuasion. They said, you can come to Whole Foods, Jamaica Plain. Well, I know the 80-20 rule. And I'm like, look, the, the top three stores in uh, Whole Foods in the Northeast District, the number one is at Alewife in Cambridge. And the Jamaica Plain one was being protested and picketed by local people who didn't want like a corporate grocery store. So I'm like, I'm not crossing a picket line with a startup, like forget it. So I called them up and I said, you know, when I moved from New York City, the Alewife Whole Foods was, was my, my first grocery store. And there's just a nostalgic thing about starting there. Could we go there? And they're like, oh, sure. So I started off in Alewife, which was like huge. So we just sold a lot. And they made me do these food demos. And, you know, I did feel a little like, you know, uh, a minimum wage employee, like walking in with my little chef coat. <laughs> I don't think a sample is like, oh, I'm, I'm hanging out here. Uh, but again, I, I got more persuasive slash manipulative where they're like, oh, we're going to put you in the, in the food bar section. And I go, no, 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 no. I am not going to be in an ocean of competition. And I said, you know, it's a baked good. So why don't you put me in the bakery? which meant I had no competition because I was the healthiest thing. And when I told you to go to Whole Foods, I would tell you, go to the bakery section. Because when you go into Whole Foods, you get lost. So I thought at least it gets you to the right section. So I chatted up every bakery associate and I just pumped them with free bars. Bring them home, take them home, bring them to your friends. Because I thought, you know, they can persuade people's buying decisions. So I made sure that those people were treated like gold. And that was a good idea because... You know, the, the nasty stuff that goes on in food, they can place you in a crappy place. They can give you, you know, eye level placement. Um, they gave me really great prominent placement. Uh, they also taught me how to get rotated at the cash register. Then I started to design it where the thing would stack up. So I didn't take up a lot of real estate at the cash register. So I started to like learn pretty fast. And then we started to expand. And what was interesting is that we were growing. People loved us. Uh, people started to recognize me on the streets of Boston. I was like the booty bar guy. 
uh, I ended up getting this old Mercedes uh, wagon, which is kind of like this retro popular car. It's like a VW bus. And I had, I got personalized plate booty, B-U-D-I. So um, I would put it on the, on the website, you know, we make booty calls. You know, if you make place a big order. So we just like, you know, we, we really played up the booty thing a lot. And um, I went to the extension school and took a marketing class. And we had this one woman who was going to be on my team. And she was like, I am not going to be on your team unless you change the name of the company because it's offensive. And I was like, I know, I know it is, it is. And I agreed with her. So I went to my professor and I said, uh, I think I should change the name. He goes, don't you dare. He goes, people spend a million dollars to get their name remembered. He goes, they will always remember you with your booty bar because it's those people who are going to the dirty place, not you. So we kept booty bar and it still exists, B-U-D-I-B-A-R.com. Um, about four or five years into it, I realized I'm just getting a bigger, bigger, bigger break-even company. And I wasn't able to uh, create more recipes because we'd already taken up as much shelf space as we could at Whole Foods. And I basically was commoditizing myself and just selling, just selling a bigger ship. And I was getting so big that I was doing multiple demos. So I, I hired a staff. So cause sometimes we'd have demos at the same time at different stores and I wasn't doing the demos anymore. And I realized like the joy is gone and the money's not there. Um, but at the same time, uh, I was a procrastinator. So I took E5420, the entrepreneurship and innovation class as a student to get organized. And Booty Bar was my class project. And I was so afraid of, and it was really great because it gave me organization. It made, it made me accountable. I had to make a pitch and all that. And I loved the class. And I was really afraid of falling back uh, into procrastination. So I went to the, the instructor, who's still an instructor, Jim Fitchett. And I said, could I, could I take the class next semester just to kind of stay fresh? And he said, well, uh, why don't you be a grader? Because we can't just have you rolling in. So they, they made me a grader. And then I started to look at the class as not students, but as customers. And I said, you know, the model of teaching is, is, is upside down. You know, the students pay the instructor, but the instructor's the boss and intimidates them and makes them scared. So like, but really we work for the students. They, they pay our paycheck. And I'm like, it's upside down. We should serve them. So I started to take the concepts of the class and started to look at the class like a customer and said, what is the class missing? Where's the gap? And I said, you know, Jim, you, we make these students form teams, but we don't give them any time during class to form a team. And they, they form teams geographically, like, oh, you're sitting to my left, you're sitting to my right, come on my team. You know, I'm like, that's a bad way to choose people. So I said, could I start doing these um, weekend workshops where I would teach people how to really choose teams? So I started to look in, how do you choose teams? And it's pretty simple. I came up with this very simple model of, you get people that have similar values with diverse strengths. So let's say Lynn might want to be on my team. We need to make sure that we have the same values of, let's say, being punctual, meeting our deadlines. Um, and if we're both accountants, that's not a fit. I could be the accountant, she needs to be the creative. So we need to have the similar value system and different strengths, and that makes a dream team. And I started to teach that, and you, we started to see people that took the weekend workshops uh, were getting better grades. And then I realized they don't know how to pitch. So I started to teach them how to pitch, and I kept just looking at gaps in the class. And so the weekend workshop started to develop more and more. And then again, I got bored and I said, Jim, I, I wanna be on the teaching team. And so they took me in and I realized I really love teaching. Um, I felt like that was, um, I felt like it was my time to start giving back. So I started teaching uh, part-time. Uh, I sold Booty Bar because I was, I was tired of that. Uh, and that was an interesting experience. I didn't know how to sell a company. Uh, but at the time, I was interviewed on a, a, a TV show called Chronicle, and someone saw it, and this guy named Steve Schneider called me out of the blue. He had just retired as a CFO of a publicly traded company. He lived in Wellesley, and he said, um, you know, I'm intrigued by your food company. I'd like to do something with you. Um, the minute I met that guy, I didn't like him, and I should have listened to my gut. Uh, what a nightmare that was. The only, the only startup I had that was a failure, in my opinion, because I didn't listen to myself. So for the guys in the room, listen to your gut, because it's not this emotional thing. I mean, there's, there's some intelligence there that we're just not tapping into. So um, I didn't like the guy when I first met him. And the reason was I was 
I got caught in the 08 thing and I, I had about $10 million stolen by Bernie Madoff. So I had to sell my lake. And so yeah, things, financially things got upside down really fast. So I had, to, I had to dump the lake, but to do my own short sale, I needed a, a short-term loan of $400,000 uh, for about a month. And one of my real estate partners, I was doing some side investing, hard money lending, uh, Stephen Blum, he introduced me to Steve Schneider and said, you know, Steve's actually a lender. So Steve wanted me to do this other food business with him that ended up being startup number four, Bolt Chocolate. But he started out loaning me 200,000 and this other guy who I never met uh, loaned me the other 200,000. Well, I closed my deal so fast with the bank, I did it in three days. And I, I said to Steve, I don't need the money for a month, I, I, I need to repay it. So Steve came up with the idea of maybe we can get you lower interest uh, because you only had the money for a little bit. Well, the guy that I never met with his $200,000 loan, he cut my interest in half. And Steve Schneider, my new business partner to be, didn't. And he said, a deal's a deal. And I thought, ah, okay. So I get better treatment from a stranger than my new business partner to be. But I thought, I get it, a deal's a deal. Didn't listen to myself, second time. Didn't listen to myself, and I should have. One, I didn't like the guy uh, at all. And the other was, you know, I get better treatment from a stranger. So there's sign number two that I ignored. Well, after the, um, after the, the Lake deal went through, uh, I decided that we were going to do a uh, Volt chocolate, which is basically mixing into Belgian chocolate, 200 milligrams of L-theanine and 50 milligrams of caffeine, which gives you um, uh, hyper-focusing concentration. So it was basically going to be competing with people buying Ritalin, black markets. We were going to market it to colleges for test taking. Uh, and it does work. Basically, uh, 200 milligrams of L-theanine is like eight cups of green tea. It's the naturally occurring amino acid in green tea. When you mix it with caffeine, it basically gets you alert and focused. Uh, so anyhow, and we put it into a chocolate so that it gets absorbed by the oral mucosa and hits the brain in 15 minutes and avoids the digestive tract where half of it will get killed by stomach acid. So I thought it was a pretty good, pretty good idea. And Steve wanted to be a part of it. And Steve calls me and says, you know, I want to, um, let's have a celebration dinner that you sold the lake. And I was pissed. I was like, you're an asshole. And now you want to have the celebration. But the best you can do is buy me a burger. You know, when you, you clip me for like 20 grand extra on interest. So I said, um, cause I was pissed. I said, sure, I'll take you out to dinner, but let me buy. I'll treat. So he, we go out with his wife, who's pretty conservative. Um, and in the middle of the meal, I don't know why she mentioned that she was in menopause, but she did. I thought that was sort of a private thing, but she brought it up. And she's talking about her hot flashes. And Steve goes, yeah, she, she gets them in, a, in the wintertime and she rolls down the window and freezes me out in the car. So he turns to her and he goes, next time you have a hot flash, stick your head out the window like a dog. And I'm like, holy shit, like that's how you talk to your wife? And I found that to be abuse. I was like, that's just abuse there's no like for, and she took it and i thought man if that's what you do to your wife what are you going to do to me again third time i don't listen then we did start the company um he had me doing the selling i hate selling but that, to me it's the dirty work uh, but i'm good at it so i got our our stuff at the cash register on every park and ride um on the mass pike uh, at the all towns <laughs> So we're doing that and I, you know, I'm driving up and down the Mass Pike selling this stuff. And I remember we got a call that he just told me that his best friend's son committed suicide. And Steve was smart. Uh, the guy said the, the kid fell off the balcony in New York. He was doing his homework on the balcony and fell off and died. And Steve's like, it's winter time. Who does their homework outside in the wintertime? He jumped. And I was like, yeah. So Steve, Steve was smart. He was smarter than me. Um, and I said, uh, well, we're supposed to go to a chocolate manufacturer in the Bronx. Um, do you want to go to the funeral uh, after, after the, the chocolate thing? He goes, no, um, I don't want to get stuck in uh, rush hour traffic because the wake is at like 4 o'clock. And I'm like, your best friend's son died and like you're worried about yourself in traffic. So again, I'm like, you're just an asshole. And I tried to manipulate the situation by making the meeting in the Bronx coordinate where he could go to the funeral. So I did that. Um, we go down there and we're supposed to be going to the funeral home. I don't even know this guy and I'm going to go to this thing. 
And, um, and I got, I started to get nasty with, uh, with Steve. He had two, two children. And I said, gee, I hope when, when your kids, you know, die, you know, people, you don't know, plan your wake around rush hour. So I was being rude and, um, not realizing I just should not be with this guy. <laughs> and, uh, anyhow, he blew off the funeral. He wanted to get home early and I'm just shaking my head. Like, I don't want to be around you. I put 50 grand into the business. Steve put in 50 and, um, when I saw his name on caller ID, my stomach's turning. And I thought he wanted us to get bought out by Hershey's. So he was looking for like really big stuff. He was always like, you know, go big or go home. That was always his thing. And I thought, you know, the biggest nightmare is if this company takes off, I'm going to have to spend more time with this guy. And I went to a good friend of mine, uh, Paula Wood. She's worth about mm, good 40 million bucks. She owns about 300 buildings uh, in Boston. And She's, she's about 65 or 70, she's very, very wise. And I said, Paul, like, what do I do? And um, she goes, eat the 50 grand, it's not gonna hurt you. Um, she goes, he's gonna eat the 52, but you know, you don't really care. Uh, he's a big boy. And she's like, you know, you really have to take care of yourself. So I said, how do I tell someone I'm shutting down a business because I don't like you? And she said something really interesting. She said, have the meeting with the guy and before you walk in, just say, God, Give me the right words. Like, okay, I'll try it. So I, I, I had the meeting with him. I was like, hey, hey, God, can you, can you kind of hang out? <laughs> like, help me out with this one. And, um, and I, I just sat him down and I said, Steve, you know, um, I'm over 50 years old and I only have so many years left and they need to be good. And my stomach turns when I see your name coming up on my phone. And I just don't want to spend my time like that. So I need to shut it down. And he, he understood. He didn't balk at all. I think, I think I may have been the first person that ever stood up to him. But what I have learned about bullies is that all bullies are cowards, in my opinion. And he didn't push back at all. So I said, you can just take my piece of the company. I don't really care. So he, he ran it into the ground because he didn't want to sell. So uh, that, that went out. So that was what I would call my failure. And Startup number five was really fun. Uh, I ended up joining the MIT sailing team. And they, I'm not a good sailor. I, I actually, I'm, I'm like seriously mediocre, but I, but I like it. And they asked me if I wanted to be captain. I really didn't want to because when you're the captain, you don't really sail. You just like watch other people and manage them. And you're, you're like the big safety check. You're the, like the head worry wart. And I said, look guys, you know what? I'm used to climbing the ladder all the time, but quite frankly, I just want to sit on the side of the boat and look out the window. I, I think I'd be a better guest <laughs> than sailor. Well, we would, they would race the boat up to Maine every year and I would be on the crew that would bring it back. So you just chill out it's a couple of days coming back to Boston. It's a lot of fun. Well, since I was such a mediocre sailor, they wouldn't let me be the captain unless it was at night when everyone else was sleeping. So they would give me a watchman to make sure I stayed awake. We'd be out in the middle of the ocean. They would just say, you know, keep the compass going. And, and I would sail in the dark. You didn't know where you were going. And it scared most people. But to me, I pretended that I was sailing in outer space because you'd see the stars. Stars are like everywhere. And you get the, the big mass and it's just like, da -da -da. <laughs> it's really cool. So I was with my friend who... Um, He's the head of uh, training at Forrester, totally eccentric guy. And he and I were just like brainstorming. And I said, you know, I had a really brief stint with a place called the Horse Institute where we did equine experiential education, where we, we helped with the merger with Merck and Sharing Plow to get their, court, their cultures united. And we gave, brought them to a horse ring. We gave them a horse and said, you have to operate with this horse like it's part of your team. So different species, you know, different language, the whole thing, but you have to work with this thing. So it's all about team building and, and, and it works. It's a very expensive thing to do, but, but it worked. And I said, what if we did team building with a boat where the ocean is kind of like unpredictable market forces, things you can't control. But then you have the boat, which is something that you kind of can control, but you need to know how to operate the boat. And then you have the crew, which are the people that work for you. And we started to play around with, if we had a group of boats, that could be like franchises or divisions of a corporation. How do they work and communicate together? And they could have standalone boats. So we started to create this idea for MIT's executive ed department called Leadership Sailing. And it was really cool. We ended up getting um, 
the former head of Medicare, a guy named Don Berwick, uh, was one of our first uh, people to try it out. Because my friend Adam knew all these people at Sloan, and we ended up getting all the equipment for free. So Adam, I don't know how he found Don Berwick, but he did. So Don comes on the boat with his wife, and he has some healthcare company in Cambridge. And we, we said, what's the biggest problem that you have with healthcare? And he goes, the, the nurses are the ones that really run the show in the hospital, but the residents are paid more, uh, they're jerks, they're arrogant, and it's the nurses that like save them from killing patients. And they're like, residents come in in, in the summertime, I think July, and he's like, you never wanna to go to the hospital in July because that's when people die because the residents screw up. And he goes, there's a lot of resentment between the nurses and the residents, and it's the patients that have poor outcomes. So if you could get those two to get along, we'd love it. So what I ended up doing is we made this cool exercise. It was a proxy where I was at the helm. So I had the big wheel and the nurses were on my one side and the, the residents were on the other. And I said, okay, here's the deal. The nurses, you have to go around this buoy over here and the residents, you have to go around this buoy over here, which were on opposite sides. And so residents, you talk into my right ear and I'll do whatever you tell me to do. Nurses, you talking to my left ear, I'll tell you whatever you want me to do. So I would get, you know, left, right, left, right. So very easily they start to figure out at, with the 20 minute time limit that we had, I'm going right between both buoys and they're both gonna lose. So that was when we created the concept of co-opetition that you have to cooperate with your competitor, but maybe they're not your competitor. So as we got closer to the, the clock ticking down, uh, they were forced into a negotiation where they said, okay, we're going to go around my buoy first, then we're going to go around your buoy, and then we'll be successful. And, and they did it. So that was one of the concepts that we used for co-opetition. Uh, then we did another one where you would pick your leader. And the basic idea is that anyone who is going to be working with the new hire, let's say it's a CEO, you get all the people who are in the corporation as crew, and then you just throw the helm to the new hire who might be the new CEO. And you see what their leadership style comes out. And what we learned is uh, a lot of men yell at people uh, and women ask for help. So it was really interesting how there was like a, a gender split. It was, it was pretty clear. Um, and, but you could see how people are gonna lead. How do they lead under crisis? So it was basically, it was like a, a crisis management thing and they didn't know that they were gonna do it. So it was an interesting way to see like, what is your leadership style when you're under the gun? Uh, you know, where do you go? Uh, we did that one. Another exercise that was my favorite is we got Boston Consulting Group to come. And it, this one even shocked me. And they called me a few days before and said, one of our team members doesn't have uh, all of his fingers. You know, can he still participate? And I said, sure, you know, we can, we can work around that. Well, the kid, they, they all come on and they all looked about the same age. That was, that, I was wrong. They, they were not the same age. Uh, I thought they all knew each other. I didn't know that they didn't. I didn't know that at BCG that when you get assigned as a team to go to a client, you might know each other 48 hours before you hit the client. I didn't know that. I thought they knew each other. So I had these two assumptions that they knew each other and they're all the same age. Wrong and wrong. Well, we got out on the water and uh, we do a thing called uh, an exercise called egg drop soup where I go, okay, this is like the prisoner's dilemma. You're going to get two eggs. Uh, one egg you have to hold on a spoon and you have, let's imagine it's like this. You have to hold it on a spoon while you're tacking and sailing. Uh, if it breaks, you lose a point. If it stays intact, you keep your point. Uh, and then we're gonna give you a second egg, uh, which is gonna be the other team. So you're gonna get the other team's egg. In private, you can go down below, and if you crack their egg, they lose a point. If you keep it intact, uh, they get the point. So it was the prisoner's dilemma that what you wanna do is that you wanna crack the egg and not have them crack yours. But if they both crack or both don't crack, you're neutral. So the kid that didn't have the fingers was laughing and saying, oh, I'm gonna crack your egg, I'm gonna crack your egg. And he was like joking around. We go down below and he's with his good hand, he's being Mr. Macho Man, and he cracks the egg sideways, like it's, it's almost impossible to crack an egg sideways. And he did it and uh, he puts it in. And then the next crew came, that, that was a, a crew of two. Then the next group comes down, which was uh, a woman and a guy and they didn't crack the egg. So we do the exercise, and uh, when we do the unveil, um, the guy, the, the woman unveils that her, her egg was cracked, and her face just dropped. She's like, she was just so deceived. She's like, I can't believe you cracked my egg. And 
the guy with that with the with the finger thing, uh, he's laughing. He's like, I told you I was gonna crack your egg, I told you I was gonna crack your egg. And I as a facilitator can't judge, but I can ask pointed questions. So I said, Did you use humor as a form of deception? And he just paused too long. And I was like, okay. And then I went to the team that had their egg cracked. Uh, and I said, what would you have done differently? And the guy who was with the woman, he said, nothing. And I said, what do you mean nothing? You lost. He goes, well, for the price of an egg, I know who I can trust on my team. And I didn't realize he was the boss. He was his boss. And this guy had only worked for him for two days. So it got really serious. So like you get some really, I, I, we were, I mean, oh, oh, it was tense. <laughs> when that happened, I was like, ah, oh, this guy has like no more future at BCG. So that was, it was a fascinating company to start. I absolutely loved it. And I was really proud of myself from the fact that it was a, an original idea. Like I didn't copy off of anyone like I did with Jerry, Jerry Appel, even though I made my most money with, with MMR. Um, yeah, you know, market timing was never my idea. I never knew what market timing was till I worked for Jerry. So I always felt like I kind of, you know, copied. Um, and I wanted to do something original and stand on my own two feet. So leadership sailing, I was really, really proud of. Um, uh, financially, it was a bad idea. MIT, we found out self-insurers. They made us put a $2 million policy in front of them. I did not know that any kind of water activity is the highest uh, insurance rate possible in the industry. Like it's worse than race car driving, it's worse than fireworks. So it was $8,000 an hour for insurance. So the money, um, yeah, the, the money just went away uh, with the insurance. You know, and then weather-wise, it's, it's really not good climate-wise to have a, a sailing business in Boston. It's really something that should be like in the Caribbean or, or San Diego. So um, my partner, Adam, he had gotten a job at Raytheon working on the Patriot missile, and that just took all this time away. So I had a 50-50 deal with a partner that just became absent, who had all the contacts at MIT. And I said, um, no, you've, you've, you've started to become unreliable. You're not answering emails. Um, he was emotionally ignorant. Uh, very popular guy, charismatic, but he could turn it on and off. And it was more off than on with me. And I thought, look, I don't need another asshole for a partner. So I, I shut that one down, but I, I love that one. And then startup number six is Boston executive training. Um, and that was just an audacious idea where I was like, you know what, I just want to travel around the world, have someone pay for it, um, be with people that, that take me around and kind of be my free tour guide. So that was sort of the audacious idea. And what I do now is I travel around the world doing public speaking, teaching you whatever you want to learn, blockchain, change management, entrepreneurship. Um, just pay for my airfare, my hotel, and my food. Uh, these people pick me up at the airport. Um, I have automatic friends. I go to places I've never been to. And God, it's just been, it, it's been an amazing adventure. I've, I've lived in Beijing for a summer, which was just a dream. I lived in Chengdu for uh, a couple of months. I've made amazing friends. Expats are so friendly. I mean, Boston's such a cold shoulder city. I, I, I made more friends in China <laughs> than I have at Harvard in my entire career, and I'm really not kidding about that. Um, yeah, Asia's wonderful. I mean, they have taken me to the Philippines. I go to Cambodia and Vietnam for Viet Challenge every summer. Um, I've been to Japan a couple of times, and it's just been amazing that it's also a tax-free thing. I mean, I'm getting a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of value, but there's no income. And they just give me a ticket and the hotel, so I don't have to report income. I just show up and, and you know what it is, is that I'm having fun, I'm meeting really cool people, I'm having an adventure, I'm teaching them stuff that they are so grateful for. And the further away you get from Harvard, the more they appreciate it. I mean, I've, I've given speeches to about 50,000 people in China. Uh, I mean, I sign autographs, it's ridiculous. These, these women come up, give your autograph. They, they ask, they, they connect with me on WeChat. And, um, you know, I feel valued and I really give them my best. And it's just been an, an amazing thing. And what I'm learning is that for me personally, um, I think for everyone here in the room, just get a, a personal sense of where you sit with money. Uh, and for me, um, it's taken me a while to figure it out, but I don't like to look at price tags. I want, if I want something, I want it, but I'm not extravagant. So 
that's an interesting one. I don't want to be constrained by not being able to afford anything, but I don't really want that much. I live in a one bedroom apartment. I'm totally content. I mean, it's a nice one bedroom, but I don't need a five bedroom house anymore. So I'm, I'm starting to realize and just listen to what do I need? Um, I'm also really low key on the money thing. I, I don't lend money. I don't buy people things. Um, whenever possible, I'll just do things that don't involve money. Like, uh, I'll say, come into my house for dinner. You know, you'll let me give you a steak at my, at, at my home, but you don't want me to bring you to the Capitol Grill. Uh, I find that bringing money into the equation makes people feel really uncomfortable. Uh, I mean, like my friend Paula, you know, she's worth 40 million bucks. She took me out to Oba and Pam for breakfast and she's like, get whatever you want. I got a boiled egg because I didn't want to look abusive, like getting the, the, the salmon with the everything bagel and the wasabi sauce. That's what I wanted. But I didn't want to be like abusive getting the most expensive bagel on the menu. Instead, I got an egg. And I'm kind of like, wow, how many people have done that to me? So, um, you know, my relationship with money is really a lot different. And retirement, uh, what a bad idea. That was my biggest mistake. Um, I'll never retire. I'm just going to teach until, uh, you know, I can't anymore. And teaching has been a real passion. You know, it's not the biggest money maker, but it's enough. I make more money off of my investments, but you know, I'm fine. And I think, um, it's taken me 53 years to stop listening to the messaging I get from other people about what I should be and what I should do. And, you know, this whole coronavirus thing has, has really been wonderful for me. And I realized how much time and effort I spend on doing things for other people and their judgment. Like I realized that my house was decorated the way my mother decorates the house. It's from the front door in from the guest perspective. And I'm like, how, often, how much time do I spend at the front door? It really should be for me being inside looking out. So I've totally redecorated my apartment, you know, the way that I want. And it's just kind of fun being an individual, but I really realized I thought I was an independent thinker. No, but, but by being in isolation, I realized that um, I do a lot of things for other people's judgment and approval. And it's really nice being tucked away where I don't have to do that anymore. And it feels really, really good. So in closing, I would just encourage you, uh, if there's anything that I've said tonight that's, that's helpful, please take it. Um, but don't waste your time doing things that you think you should do. And um, also be, you know, listen to your gut because of the messaging that we get. I thought I was an independent thinker and not nearly as much as I thought. So I'm done. Thank you for listening. And uh, we have a few more minutes. If anyone wants to uh, raise a hand, ask questions, comments, um, I'm happy to, happy to help. And Allison, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, of course. That was wonderful. Very insightful and detailed. Um, very engaging. Um, but yeah, at this point, you know, again, like part of, you know, the, the goal with doing the workshop and the conversation is about listening to what Michael mentioned about what, you know, his startups um, from the financial, but really the emotional. So what, what are some questions or thoughts that some of you have to provide Michael that he can, you know, respond to for you? Uh, well, it's on I see he has a hand up. So I just wanted to say, like, as someone who's going to be entering into the job market, this was really insightful to see someone who's been there and you've gone through depression, anxiety, and in the end, you chose your passion. So I was really, like, really impressed, like, um, the way you spoke about your partners, how you choose your partners, and you look at how they are as people as well, not just looking at what they can bring to you. So I thought that really stood out. Oh, well, thank you. I hope it helps you with your career. Uh, Carlos, hi. Hi, Michael. How are you? I have the opportunity to spend time with you in, in the class with John Westman in sailing. It was oh, fun. yeah. How you doing? Yeah. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. And uh, yeah, I'm th I think you are a good seller, by, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I, I really appreciate, I mean, what it I mean, what it struck me a lot was that you, you were always things that you really wanted, you went after them. I mean, somehow you did not hesitate. And this is something that is, is I think it's probably because it's you, but sometimes people think twice in order to make the step. And, and I liked, you know, early in your career, 16, 18, you made a decision and you went for it. And, and I think that 
you know, people sometimes think twice and have self self doubt. And I think that what it strikes me is thinking internally, right? And what what I like is throughout, you know, the experience that you you actually walk us through. It is every time that resonates with with me that you will always say, you know, you, you look inside more than you look outside, mm-hmm. and, and and that is something that you know some, somehow it is okay. It is getting to know you a lot and say, you know, I want this. I, I you know, I think I'm, I can do it. The other thing that struck me a lot was that, you know, you uh, roll up your sleeve right with a booty bar and. Sometimes you have to go back to basic. And you say, I, I, I didn't feel comfortable, but you did it, right? And, 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 and that is the other thing around you know, business and entrepreneurship that I think that resonated with me a lot. Uh, sometimes you have to do what you have to do in order to, to get it there uh, and no, not be afraid. I think that was a really good message. Well, thank you. Uh, one thing that, that does help me with, um, I think that what they say, the difference between courage and bravery is being scared and doing it anyhow. Uh, I, I do stuff that I'm scared, scares the hell out of me, but I still do it. And what, what motivates me is um, I do not want to live a life of regret. I do not want to be on my deathbed being like, I wish I had taken my shot. I do take my shot. And that, that is what motivates me. I, I actually have a friend, Trevor. Um, he was having some challenges with a, a former employer and uh, you know, he just wanted things to be okay. And that wasn't on the table. And I said, Trevor, you know, you got, you have two choices here. You're either going to be a coward or you're going to be a hero. There is no in between. Which one's it going to be? And I just would never be a coward. I can't do it. Can't do it. I don't feel good about being a hero either, but given those two options, it's like, phew, shit, go for it. And if I fail, at least I gave it a shot. Um, you know, I've got some scars, but uh, what I don't have, I have no regrets at all. Zero. I sleep well. I treat people right. I have never screwed anyone in my life. I, I don't look over my shoulder. Um, would I have done things differently? No, because actually all the really shitty things that happened to me really amazing things happen. If I hadn't had my money stolen by Bernie Madoff, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be a teacher. And a teacher has been actually the most satisfying job I ever had. And teaching undergrad has been amazing. It's the first year that I've done it. And a lot of people don't want to do it because that's where the lowest pay grade is. You get more money on the grad side. But I get to watch a student for four years instead of like an extension school student that comes in for a semester. And it's, it's wild. I'm actually in like I have students that have taken, they, they're like on their second or third class with me. And I'm like, I know you, like, I know you, I know about you. And it's, it's cool. I mean, I could see a graduation. I'll be like the guy crying in the back, like, Oh, there goes my children. <laughs> so, so it's kind of cool. Uh, I, I like it. Um, but yeah, it's really funny that, you know, when you take money off the table, how I make much different choices, much different choices, but I'm probably more satisfied than I've ever been. And like I work at Harvard and Holt, I get much more satisfaction out of Holt than Harvard. Um, Harvard's like this arm's distance thing, uh, not the students, but the administration. I feel like it's, um, you know, oh, please come in the back door. Uh, you don't have a PhD, mm, really need to work on that. I always feel like I'm never good enough, not really welcome, uh, come through the service entrance. Um, at Holt, it's like a family. You know, the students hug me and I'm like, oh, no, no, someone's gonna call HR. But, <laughs> But they're not like that. They're like kind of cool with hugging you. And I'm like, oh, I'm not going to get in trouble. I'm a hugger. Uh, so it's really weird to like work at a place that is, is so different. Um, but I, I'm really honored because a lot of our Holt students, very few Americans, they're all from somewhere. And it's so cool to like be working. I feel like I work at the United Nations. And it's just really interesting to have people just kind of be on the ground in certain countries just tell me what it's like. Because that perspective is not something you can get out of the news or, or an article. And uh, so it's, it's, it's been really cool to, to work at Holt. I really enjoy it. Uh, I see Raj has a hand up. Well, well, actually, before we get there, Aaron had thrown a question on the chat. Oh, sure. Let me take a picture. Which was, how did you know being an entrepreneur was your bliss? Uh, well, I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. It was my father that threw me into it when I was 16. And when I mer- made my first sale, um, it was like you know, $125 commission. It just it was like a drug. It was like, oh my God, I can create money out of thin air. And 
just the, the power was amazing. Um, also, when I had the money management firm, I basically said, you only need to answer three questions. What to buy, when to buy it, and when to sell it. And that's why I did money management, because I thought I just had to figure out three things. Uh, which <laughs> it's somewhat naive in hindsight. But, um, but yeah, I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. But I, I'm actually not so much now. I mean, I do have the consulting firm, but I'm really an employee uh, of Holt and Harvard. And you know what I like about it? I don't have to sell. They just bring me the students. I do have to sell the courses, you know, make sure that my, my course is going to be popular. Um, but, you know, you make less money for it. But I, I kind of like it. I just get to focus on teaching and, and trying to make online teaching more interesting and engaging because a lot of people don't like it. Uh, I'd rather have an in-person class. But, you know, my effort is to kind of gamify it. Like, let's make online teaching uh, better on some levels than in-person. Um, and you can. I mean, I've, I've gotten much more networking in my classes because I throw people into random breakout groups. And normally when you're in a classroom, you sit at the same table and you hang out with the same people. So I think you get actually much more socialization uh, by doing breakout groups. And uh, I do try to make it more engaging. Uh, but again, you know, it's, it's a game. And, and I ask my students for help. Uh, I, I said to them in my human resources class, what do you need that's going to make it interesting? And they wanted debates. So we, we had a debate team and it was really interesting. Uh, it, it would never occur to me to to have debates. Uh, so we're doing those now in our classes. So, um, and I also let my students create their own exams. I just say, here are the course, here's the course outcomes. You have to hit the course outcomes and pitch me on what you want your exam to be. And they come up with some interesting stuff too, but they also really like the autonomy. Uh, and I get a lot of heat for that. Other instructors are like, you are screwing it for me, man. Like, <laughs> what? I just wanted to get my multiple choice exam and you're making me like up my game. And I'm like, Pfft. Sorry, dude. <laughs> you need to like make the world better. You know. <laughs> Sorry. So yeah, I don't hang out in the teachers' lounge much. <laughs> they, like yell at me. <laughs> um, now there's Raj. Raj, hi Raj. Hey Michael, how are you doing? Good. How you um, doing? Good, good. I, I was part of two classes of yours: um, uh, the entrepreneurship class as well as the sales class. Uh, yeah, awesome. I recognize your voice. How you doing? <laughs> good, good. And I remember the time when we used to meet at uh, that Starbucks um, right off. Yeah. Now, so I was wondering, do you have any of those individual sessions anymore? I mean, is that kind of thing that you do virtually now or? I mean, so, like meeting with students? Yeah, individual uh, 15 minutes you used to give us a 15 minute slot if you're. Yeah, sure. But the easiest way to get a hold of me is uh, going through WhatsApp. That's where most of my students go. I'll put in my cell phone. Uh, so connect with me on WhatsApp there. Anyone can do it. I'm more than happy to do a 15 minute chit chat with anybody. Um, yeah, just connect with me there. And uh, then we just kind of like FaceTime on the WhatsApp. It's pretty easy. It's easier than Zoom. You know, you just hit the button and, and, and you're in. So uh, right. happy to do that. Yeah, some of your, uh, some of your thoughts at the time uh, about how to find a partner were really helpful. I mean, you, you told me, I, I do remember, take your wife to the meeting and she will be able to judge the person better. Uh, I remember, I mean, she has a better institution. Women do have a better intuition. Yeah, learn from them. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I took that. So I, I want to get more of those insights. Sure, Thank you. sure. Good. Yeah, my Great pleasure. Talk, by the Thank you. Thanks. So, Sabina, hi. Yeah. Hi, Michael. Thanks again doing? for all your insight. I have a question because I'm at the point where I'm graduating this summer um, from the Harvard Extension School uh, Management degree. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, I'll do well in my last class. So my question is, I've been... I, took a class on new business venturing and I'm thinking of a lot of like my last class was somebody from the Hull School actually, Professor Henriksen, and he was great and uh, thinking about a lot of new business ventures right now. But would you say like for uh, somebody who went through so many things in your life, like should we go for our passion or make some money first, then go look for our passion or we just should go for our passion? I mean, what would you say? Oh, all of it. So I'm going to put into the chat. So take a look at Ikigai. Uh, so that's basically the intersection of what you love, what people need, uh, what you get paid for, and what you're good at. So it's love, good at, 
world needs paid for. Okay, so that's, you need to have that. That's, that's phase one, okay? Mm. Um, the next one, or what I would say are high probability, uh, three steps for high probability success on a startup. I haven't published this yet, but you're welcome to use it. So it's just three things. Mm -hmm. So one is, uh, do a, I'm writing in the chat, so it's service versus a product that is just cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, you know, products are just expensive. So a service versus a product. Mm -hmm. Sell something that people need versus want. Mm -hmm. And then you get a repeat customer mm -hmm. versus a one-time customer. So for example, like I would probably sell dialysis services. You know, you're going to have that customer for eight years. I think the average life of someone on Dallas is about, about eight years. Uh, if you use a paper company, you know, would you rather sell a wedding invitation or toilet paper? <laughs> right? Yeah. Weddings once, you know, <laughs> toilet paper, a few times a day. Yeah. It's not, not great, but, you know. So I would, I would probably do some sort of service uh, that allows you to pivot. And your profit margin is kind of like limitless, uh, but really focusing on what people need versus what they want and having them come back back at you over and over again. So it's a one-time sale. And then you, then you grow the business by referral. Mm -hmm. And what I do, uh, like one of my goals, when I do public speaking abroad, um, I get two things out of it. One is that I give you, I basically under-promise and over-deliver. That's another thing that I do. Under-promise, over-deliver. And when I give people much more than what they're expecting, my goal for every public speaking event that I do is to get one person in that audience to hire me for another gig. So basically, I want to leapfrog from one event to another event. And so far, I've always been able to do that, which allows me to like always give more than what um, people are expecting. Um, but I would say that's, that's pretty much what I do. At the Harvard Coop, there's a little blue book called Ikigai. There's lots of Ikigai books. Okay. Ikigai is more, I mean, it's, it's also, it's a diet, it's a lifestyle, it's more than just a career thing. But the, the whole concept of it is where you basically have this um, amazing life by, by merging them together. Uh, there's also an interesting diagnostic that if you're missing one of the circles, uh, so if we take a look here, if you, uh, do, do, do. If you're missing love, this is where you have golden handcuffs. You're rich, but you don't like what you're doing. So that was like my copy paper company. There's a lot of Americans are doing that one. But then if you're in a nonprofit, mm -hmm. um, you're missing the money part. So there you have fulfillment, you know, but there's some resentment that you know, you're, you're not paying the bills and people aren't appreciating what you're doing. Uh, then if you have all of them, but being good at it, you have the insecurity that you're gonna be fired. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the need one is an interesting one. My cousin Robin, uh, she's a, she decorates movie stars houses like she did Tom Cruise's house. And I remember we were at Christmas one, one day and, and she married Mr. Universe. So her life looks, you know, amazing on the outside. Mm -hmm. And she just turned 40 and she's like, you know, I, my life doesn't really mean anything. I mean, who cares if, if I buy a blue couch or a brown couch? She's like, nobody needs me. So she feels useless that she feels like her life didn't have an impact. So I said, well, look, Robin, you know, you're really great at decorating, you know, but instead of doing it for the stars, you know, why don't you take your mother, who's my aunt, my aunt Patty, she had breast cancer. I go, have you ever considered the experience that women have with breast cancer when they go into a hospital that, you know, fluorescent light, uh, you know, the, the women that go in the waiting room are in the same room as women that come out after a biopsy, like maybe the entrance and the exit should be redesigned. So it's like a one way, maybe they should have soothing colors that would be more comforting for a woman. Maybe there should be like, you know, music or sound or, you know, just, just things to make the experience better. Our biggest client was actually Dana-Farber Cancer Institute because the booty bar helped people with chemotherapy uh, side effects. It just happened to be like a random um, side effect we weren't expecting. But Dana-Farber has this really, um, it's actually it's a very loving place. You know, you're in the elevator and people are like holding the door for you. They don't do that in Boston. Uh, they have like this uh, reflection garden. I think when you're getting your chemo, they give you an iPad so you can kind of like, you know, play around. And... I said, you know, why don't you take your decorating skills for where people need them instead of where people want them? 
So that's what she started to do. So she still, she still kept her, her passion of decorating, but she, she added on the need circle. So I would say you need all of them. I, and I, I wouldn't make the choice of one or the other. I would, I would grab them all. And uh, if you're looking to work for someone, uh, you pick them. I wouldn't go to the classified ads. Uh, I would pick someone that you admire and say, hey, you know what, I, I, I really admire you. I'd love to get your insights. And then you get a mentor out of it. Um, if it's someone who's older, who's already you know, made their money, they don't feel competitive with you, but you could be sort of like, you know, the, the sweat equity in the deal and they would be like the, the advisor. But um, I can tell you how many really successful people I know where no one approaches them uh, to work for them. Uh, it, it, like, I remember what Jerry said, I was the only person that ever asked him for a job. Uh, when I was doing well in the money management thing, only one person asked me for a job and he was my waiter. Uh, at my favorite restaurant in Porter Square. And he worked for me and um, uh, he became a millionaire four years later. So yeah, I mean, I would pick someone that you like and admire and take your shot. Cause you know what, you're already at no, right? So just send them a really interesting letter and uh, they'll probably be flattered. Cause you know, they're still a person too. Does that help? Yeah, thank you so much. Sure. And I so, think Allison, there was some stuff in the, in the chat. Yeah, so we have, Imran, then we have uh, Ryan, Raman, and then Aaron. So Imran's question in the chat was, is you were lucky that your first experience was great. It gave you the incentive. And also you had your father behind you to guide and support. What if you had a loss and didn't have a good experience? What would you have done? I'd gone back to McDonald's and begged to work the fry later machine. <laughs> I, mean, I had like no options. But the one thing that I, I will just sort of edit with what you put in your chat, I did not find my father supportive. I found him to be a nasty dictator making me do what he wanted, not what I wanted. I did not want to do it. And he was not supportive at all. He's like, you're going to borrow that money and you know, go hit the phones. He, he didn't really care. Um, but everything else, you know, I agreed. I mean, I, I, did, I, I feel like I just got lucky. I mean, that was a lot of money to make in a couple of weeks. Uh, so, and it was just one shot. It wasn't like they, you know, I had like that money coming from a hundred clients. It came from one guy. So, you know, the universe was smiling on me. So I, I did get definitely, um, you know, an encouraging start. If it had gone the other way, I probably would have never been an entrepreneur because I was scared to begin with. I mean, I felt that there was a lot of security in working for someone, but I look at that differently now too. I think that, um, if you're working for someone, I remember I got this idea when I was uh, in a CVS. It was, it was actually, it wasn't, it was a Dwayne Reed. It was like a CVS in Manhattan. I walked in and I could see the guy was like the owner of the franchise. He looked like the boss. And there were all these cashiers uh, at their, their register. And I thought, you know what? These, they were all women. And this is this guy. And I said, these women will never, ever in a million years make as much money as that guy will. Because they're the workers, he's the boss. And I thought, but they're taking the same amount of risk as he is, because if he screws up and goes out of business, they lose their job like him. So I actually think there's less risk in having your own business. That was where I got that idea from. I don't think it's that risky to have your own business. The upside is unlimited, but your downside is the same as being an employee or an employer. It's the same. And you're dependent. So I said, take your shot. Absolutely. Uh, Ryan, you uh, had messaged and then we have Raman and then Aaron. Yeah, so I had a question. You seem to have some good insights on external regulation and people doing things like you said, like having the nice Audi, having the you know big house and so on versus doing what intrinsically motivates them. I, I want to see what your perspectives are on that because I do, I'm just trying to do a little bit of research in that area. And most people are regulated by what other people think of them. You know, they're, they're signaling to people. Yet we all know that when you are intrinsically motivated to do something, that's when it feels better, right? So why do you think that we are inclined to go towards that external regulation? What are your thoughts on that? I would say it's a combination of a low self-esteem and constant messaging that we get all the time. I mean, if you really look at the conflicting messaging that we get, you hear all the time, oh, money doesn't matter, it's happiness and love and all that. But do you, do you get that in an ad? 
Yeah. You know, I mean, it's like we're constantly barraged with, you know, be, be bigger, more beautiful, more wealthy, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, I, I think we're constantly pulled from, from, one end to, from one end to another. And, you know, we all have our self-doubt. I mean, we all know that our outsides look a lot better than our insides. And I think marketers really know how to poke at that. And they, they really manipulate it. So I think it takes a lot, of, um, a lot of courage and self-esteem. Actually, I think everyone has issues with self-esteem. There's a really great book, uh, I'll put it into the chat, The Seven Pillars of Self-Esteem. Um, it's really good and, and it will allow you to just kind of take a look at, you know, of one of the pillars, like, you know, where, where are you doing okay? You know, where do you need some help? Um, uh, there's also another one. I think there's a lot of stuff that does, um, that people should take a look at. There's also the ACEs quiz, uh, which is about childhood trauma. Uh, it's a quick quiz. You can just Google it. It, it kind of shows you, uh, we've all had trauma as a child, but that actually comes into your adulthood uh, and plays out in very important ways that we really can't see. But if you end up getting a high ACEs score, and I think most people do, uh, there is a group called ACA that I've gone to. I don't like the name because it doesn't really um, tell you much about it, but it stands for Adult Children of Alcoholics and Dysfunctional Families. I think everyone comes from a dysfunctional family. Uh, or at least there's, there's some random weird aunt or uncle you know, in the house somewhere. Uh, but I find the ACA Red Book, which you can get on Amazon. When I read that book, I'm like, how the hell did you know about my family? Like my grandfather was an alcoholic. Um, my father left the house when he was 25 from New Jersey down to Maryland to like start over. My grandmother, excuse me, my mother, she left Virginia when her, her dad died. Her mother freaked out and left the family at the funeral. So my mother had lost both parents on the same day. She went north to Maryland. So my parents had both kind of left like a bad family situation. And their plan was, let's make the perfect family and everything would be all right. So I grew up in this household where everything was just bullshit. It was just, everything's perfect. We're not going to talk about that. A uh, lot of secrets. And I was just the rebel. I was like, why do we have to pretend that everything's fine when it's not? I never fit into my family, but I realized, you know, this, but it, it stuck with me. You know, I'm a perfectionist. That came from my family. Um, I, can, I can't go out of the house unless my bed's made. Otherwise, I feel like I've done something wrong. So I think it's really interesting to see, just to be aware of the impact that your childhood had on you, because it just plays out in life. And at some point you have to say, look, what worked as a kid doesn't work as a grown up, and I need to get rid of that and come up with different things. Um, personally, I'm a workaholic and if I goof off too much, I feel guilty. I have to convince myself that it's okay to sit on the couch on a Saturday and watch TV if that's what I want to do. You know, and I find that even in my social time, I do something productive, go out for a bike ride, it's gotta be 10 miles. When I do some exercise, got to be a yoga class, like do the headstand. It's like, can I just like be nice to me? <laughs> you know, like, give me a break. So yeah, I think really learning about where you come from um, it, is really impactful. And I don't think anyone escaped childhood <laughs> without like a scar or two. But I think being aware of it can really help you, um, you know, going forward. Absolutely. Thank you. So we have, uh, Ram has his hand up and then Aaron had a question on chat. So Ram, go ahead. Hi. Um, well, let me begin by saying thank you. Your insights were definitely helpful and were not obstreperous at all. <laughs> I'm glad our paths crossed. I'm getting a tech degree, so I haven't taken your class yet. Um, I wanted to share that I have bought Booty Bar uh, from, off of Amazon. And, oh, you uh, have? Oh, did you like them? Yeah. Well, let's just say I will not reorder. <laughs> <laughs> they are expensive. <laughs> they are like they're a good meal replacement. I'm yeah. a Buddhist, so I was I found it to be the name to be interesting. I only bought it because of the name. Oh, gotcha. Uh, actually, if you put them in the freezer, uh, they get chewy um, and they don't freeze, so they're actually a little bit tastier in the freezer. So, <laughs> little little hack. Well, I might take your class in the future, and no question, just wanted to say thank you for being you and sharing your story so vividly. Oh, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Uh, then we have Erin on chat. She had asked, do you think your psychology degree helped slash helped you 
better understand people's behavior? I would say yes. I'm, I'm actually applying to uh, University of Pennsylvania's Master of Applied Positive Psychology program in the fall. Uh, I was rejected from that about 10 years ago, and I'm going for a second shot. I think I might get into it this time. Um, I didn't get a degree in psychology. I took the positive psychology class, and a lot of those resources are uh, online. In fact, I'll just put them into the chat that you can go to just Google UPenn uh, MAP program. Uh, there's just a lot of free information there. You, you can basically learn uh, how to be happy. In fact, let me just run to YouTube really quickly because I just did a talk on positive psychology for post-traumatic growth where you can grow through a, um, uh, a traumatic event because basically everyone's kind of having a, a lot of people are having a tough time right now. Let me just pull that one up while we're, while we're talking here. I just did it the other day. I'll just put the link in. Nice. Uh, yeah, it's called the science of happiness. It's great. Uh, okay. So while I'm doing that, what's next? That I've, we have cleared through the hand raising and the questions on the chat. Beautiful. Okay. Well, there's the, the YouTube video. I just did this one the other day. Uh, if you're looking for techniques, basically to uh, be in a better headspace, you know, while we're all in isolation, a lot of this is what's called benefit finding, uh, where you kind of look for, you know, what's really cool that wouldn't have happened had I not come to coronavirus. Like, you know, I wouldn't have started painting. That's, that's my latest painting over there. It's paint by numbers, but I don't care. <laughs> on the... <laughs> it looks good. <laughs> um, uh, also bonsai farming. I'm now a bonsai farmer. So I, you know, clip a leaf once a week. So that's, that's kind of cool. Um, by the way, scallops and honey mustard dressing is really good because I'm just doing random stuff with sauces. Like, it's just got to board. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, the, the thing is all stuff, uh, basically social scientists have done. Uh, it, it is cool that you can learn how to be happier. Um, and there's a PERMA model. Basically, it's the, the intersection of positive emotions, engagement, relationships, meaning, and accomplishments, that if you get all of those, uh, you're going to have a, a really good life. So uh, that hour is you know, probably worth investing in if, if you're having a tough time. And forward that to other people. My sister has a customer that was super depressed because uh, of the social isolation, and she found that the tape helped her. So feel free to share that one around. And you know, obviously, it's free, um, and it's just something I'm, I like to uh, share with people.